Welcome to the frontiers of learning. Wherever in the world you're joining from, we're thrilled that you are here. Today, we're celebrating what's happening at the very forefront of workforce learning. You'll hear from Danica Kradzic around how AI has the potential to transform how we learn, and from the SANA team around how we're realizing that potential. Novartis Chief Learning Officer Simon Brown will share more about how curiosity is the unique ingredient to learning. Laurie Niles Hoffman, Senior Learning Strategist at Niles Nolan, will share more about learning in the flow of work. And Peter Manike Rieber, Head of Digital Learning at Novo Nordisk, will share about how they are making learning measurable. These are the leaders and the voices forming the future of learning. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have them with us here today. Before we take a look at what's ahead, let's take a moment to reflect on what brought us here. Today, wherever we look, we're surrounded by new realities. The reality of a global pandemic is millions of health workers around the world having to learn how to treat COVID-19 patients overnight. The reality of a fourth industrial revolution is over one billion workers looking to develop new skills. And the reality of the climate crisis is leaders around the world having to learn how to transform into sustainable business models. That's why our mission at SANA Labs is to apply recent breakthroughs in artificial intelligence to personalize the learning experience based on how you learn and what you need to know. Serving up the right content to the right person at the right time. You might be asking, what exactly are these breakthroughs and how are they enabling personalized learning? To answer those questions and more, here's Danica Kradzic. Hello, my name is Danica Kragic, and I am a professor of robotics and artificial intelligence at the Royal Institute of Technology. I am here to explain how recent advances in these areas are enabling a new era of personalized learning. Before we get into the technology, we should start with the basics. What exactly is personalized learning and why should we care about it? Personalized learning is the ability to address the distinct learning needs and aspirations of an individual. It is the opposite of a one-size-fits-all approach where learners receive the same type of material, instruction and assessments. In a study conducted by educational psychologist Benjamin Bloom, students exposed to more personalized learning did not only enjoy the process more, they also achieved better results. Performing two standard deviations above average and outperforming 98% of students using non-personalized learning techniques. I say, what if every student around the world could perform two standard deviations better? Just imagine the possibilities and progress that would catalyze. You may be asking, why aren't we there yet? The short answer is, until recently, we haven't had the technology. But in the past few years, the field of artificial intelligence has delivered important breakthroughs. And some of the findings are inspired by how the human brain functions. Inside our brain, there are 100 billion neurons forming 100 trillion connections. As we experience and interact with the world, our brains are constantly adjusting the connections, strengthening some, weakening others, and of course, creating new ones. Think about an algorithm doing something similar in an educational scenario, providing explanations when needed, making connections to what the individual already knows, directing them towards what to look for next. This is incredibly powerful when it comes to education and learning. Because when engaged in learning, we may generate a lot of data. Consider one of my master's students. If I give them a test and they make a mistake on a multiple choice question, there are many reasons for making the mistake. But each answer may reveal something about what the student needs help with. Imagine scaling up that analysis to all the questions they get wrong over the course of their degree, finding if there is a pattern in what they need help with. 
and providing the most appropriate path forward. What does this ultimately mean for learning? It means a revolution, democratization, the next printing press, a new and dynamic medium for helping each individual. Everyone deserves the possibility to realize their potential, to keep evolving and growing. With a little help of artificial intelligence, we can turn that possibility into a reality. Thank you, Danica. At Sana Labs, exploring and evolving these technologies has been part of our DNA since the very beginning. To share more about our journey and how we're applying AI to transform the learning experience, here's Sana Director of Research, Oscar Tekstra. Thanks, Joel. Much of the technology we use in our daily lives evolved through incremental improvements. But every now and again, a big breakthrough comes along, a discovery that propels the entire field forward. The success of deep neural networks in machine learning, just as Danitia mentioned, was one of those breakthroughs. I was working at Google Research at the time, figuring out how to make computers understand human language. And as I saw how these technologies were fundamentally transforming other industries, I decided to join SANA to apply these breakthroughs in machine learning to human learning. And I'm proud to say that in the past few years, we had a few breakthroughs of our own. This is one of them, SANA's search. It looks similar to any other search bar you might find on the internet, but it's quite different. Instead of giving you a list of links in response to your question, having to click through to find your answer, when I type a question into SANA about any course or module I'm studying, SANA can do this, both the material you're studying as well as the question you're asking. And because SANA generates the answer based on this deep understanding, it produces an answer in natural language, just like if your colleague had written it. Today, SANA search is more powerful and accurate than ever, answering complex questions in a second. And thanks to the power of AI, it will keep getting smarter. Even with all that power, AI on its own can transform learning. It's only when we combine AI with design and learning science, when these three things combine, that beautiful things really start to happen. So we built an interdisciplinary team at SANA, a team that obsesses over the learner and what they need. We can collect data on anything from the time spent on a question to the number of attempts made, to the lessons and videos we viewed. And by combining all of this rich data with state-of-the-art machine learning, we can pinpoint your knowledge gaps precisely and highlight exactly the piece of information you need in order to close that gap. Our tools allow us to capture data on a more detailed level than ever before and gain whole new sets of insights on how humans learn. Data is the new voice of the learner. And by listening to that voice, we can challenge the current paradigms and achieve things that were previously not possible. This is what our team at SANA is relentlessly exploring. Things like generating questions in natural language targeted at precisely your knowledge level, or pinpointing exactly when to revisit something you learned based on how likely you are to forget it, helping you to quickly and effectively pick up new knowledge and solidify what you already learned. Helping people become better learners, that's what fuels our passion at SANA. By analyzing all the rich data we capture and combining it with state-of-the-art machine learning, we translate insights into incredible learning experiences. That's the power and the beauty of what we do, and what I believe the team at SANA does better than anyone else. Thank you, Oscar. With all these advances, the possibilities for the future of learning feel endless. Our vision for the future of SANA is a vision for the future of your organization's potential. It's the next chapter in our story, and I can't wait to put it into your hands. Let's start with the learning experience. There's never been a learning experience quite like SANA. SANA is your personal learning assistant, designed to fit seamlessly into your everyday life, surfacing the right content wherever you are. By understanding your skills, your role, and where you want to be, SANA creates your unique learning path, placing you at the exact right level based on your pre-existing knowledge, coaching you to what you need to know, and celebrating your wins along the way. Just like a tutor, SANA answers your every question, highlighting the key points 
and surfacing related lessons so you are equipped to learn more. By meeting you in these moments and adapting to how you learn, SANA helps you learn in half the time, remember the knowledge three times longer, and most importantly, rediscover the beauty and the power of learning. Now, let's talk about authoring and how we're making that process more intuitive, collaborative and insightful than ever before. San is your copy editor, learning designer and analyst all rolled into one. Whether you're starting from scratch or ingesting existing material, Sana's range of template designs and AI-powered writing assistant make sure your content has never looked or sounded better, whatever the language. With real-time editing and commenting, Sana makes the authoring process collaborative and energizing. And once you hit publish, Sana measures how learners are responding and reading to make sure that you can improve the content where and when it's needed the most. Last, but certainly not least, let's talk about analytics. Data may be the new voice for the learner, but unless we're responding to what we hear, that data is of limited value. SANA is the power of a thousand analysts in your hands, allowing you to track strengths and skill gaps, connect business data to learning performance, and get the insights you need wherever you need them, however you want to see them. So that you can make more informed decisions faster, support your employees in a single tap, and build a stronger, more adaptive organization. With outstanding design and seamlessly integrated AI, SANA is the world's most powerful, yet intuitive learning platform that's helping companies upscale their teams in half the time and translate the learnings of today to the inventions, innovations, and leaders of tomorrow. Speaking of pioneering leaders, here's Laurie Niles Hoffman in conversation with SANA's Lauren Crichton. My name is Lauren Alice Hoffman. I've been in learning and development for 20 years, and right now I'm co-founder of Niles Nolan, and we help CLOs around the world with their edtech transformation strategies. Awesome, thank you, Laurie. Learning in the flow of work is a very popular concept in L&D right now. I'd like to kick off by asking you, what does it really mean, and why do you think it matters? It's less about just having performance support appear where people are working, and I think that's one of the, the misinterpretations of it. It's really about gathering performance metrics for insights and then surfacing the right content for people to be able to perform their jobs better and more efficiently, and ultimately to learn. And it matters because this is how we improve people. This is how we upskill them. We're doing it at the point of need rather than two or three days later or a week later when it isn't going to have the same impact. We're giving them the time to practice and implement and apply. I'm really interested in what you just said about organizations equating learning in the flow of work with performance support. Could you tell us what else it should be about and why? So what we often see in organizations is they're really focused on the short-term, high-impact, uh, just-in-time type of learning. And that's important. It, it can't go away. And they can really, really affect how organizations are operating. But sometimes they're neglecting what is the really deep skill development. And there's a number of reasons for that. It takes time. Um, you need to be really hyper-focused. You need to give people uh, the capacity to, to do deep skill development. But neglecting that means you aren't future-proofed. Right now, companies, are they can't predict what are going to be the skills required in the next five to 10 years, even in the next two for that matter. So companies who can get upskilling right for really, really deep skills acquisitions, they're the ones who are going to future-proof themselves. So they really do need to be paying attention to that. Quick wins are nice, but it is a marathon, not a, not a sprint. Speaking of marathons over sprints, what are some of the biggest barriers you're seeing amongst organizations at the moment? A lot of it can really come down to culture. Uh, companies who have tight margins and are looking at efficiencies, 
They don't want to see 15 minutes carved out or 30 minutes carved out uh, for people to be upskilling or improving their, their, their skill sets. They see that as a waste that's affecting the bottom line. And that culture is going to be killer for companies. They have to understand that when you invest in upskilling now, that's going to have longer term gains. And I would say that's one of the biggest barriers. The second barrier is L&D themselves. They need to learn how to design for learning in the flow of work. That's different from you know building a course, which will always have its place, don't get me wrong, but they also need to be thinking about the entire learner journey and experience and what their day-to-day -day work looks like. That's not something they've been challenged with uh, to date, and that's going to be a, a challenge for them. Designing with accessibility in mind is such an important point, and it feeds nicely into the topic of user experience within learning and development. What has the experience been like for employees up until now? And how does that experience need to evolve if we want to make learning a more integrated part of working life? The challenge with the traditional LMS is that it's always been seen as a destination. We know they're not great when it comes to user experience and they're, they're, they're typically clunky. What I've been talking about with the invisible LMS is less about somebody actually having to go in, remember their password, log in, search, find what they're looking for. It's, it's more about a overall experience that blends into how you're working day to day. So right now, there are multiple technologies that touch you that you don't even see day to day. So it could be a Marketo, an Eloqua, Google Ads, any of those things. Now those are marketing tools. And I really wanna separate the difference between marketing and L&D because we do have different outcomes and different performance objectives. However, there are things that we can understand and we can uh, apply from those other industries, namely how they use data to integrate seamlessly into somebody's day-to-day -day experience. There's a reason why those shoes that you looked at will appear in your Facebook feed or your, or your Instagram. It's, it's a curated experience. And the more that we could do that for L&D, imagine the possibilities. We've talked quite a bit about the current opportunities related to learning in the flow of work. What about in five years time? I'd love to hear your thoughts on what lies ahead. It's hard to predict the future, but what I imagine in five years time, what the experience will look like in say an industrial goods manufacturer, I'd like to think that we're using data points to create a better workplace. So we will have you know, sensors that will understand, and they already do exist, you know, where goods are flowing, where errors are occurring, um, where accidents have happened. And I'd like to see us use those to empower learning experiences to make the life better for that person who's working in a high pressure environment. Where do we see a drop off in when people are no longer as efficient? Do we employ more breaks? Where do we see that more um, that mistakes occur? Are we able to mitigate those and, and make an overall better experience? That's what I would like to envision in five years time. Making employees work smarter, not harder. What a beautiful note to end on. Laurie, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, Laurie and Lauren. At Sana, we're excited to be partnering with some of the world's fastest growing startups. Companies like Cree providing new ways to access healthcare. And what these startups have in common is they're making learning a strategic priority. They understand the value that learning can bring to their teams. And they need a solution as dynamic and quick as they are. Fortunately, Sana's authoring experience is plug and play. Our curated library contains courses adapted from world-leading publications, designed to build skills in everything ranging from productivity to product strategy. Teams can grab courses off the shelf and edit as needed. In a high-paced environment, having a single source of truth is key. And that's something that our startup partners have appreciated the most about working with Sana. Teams can update courses ranging from sales playbooks to negotiation toolkits to building diverse teams and know that as soon as they tap publish, their teams will have the latest knowledge available to them wherever, whenever they need it the most. To make sure the right training matches the right people, Sana automatically tags courses with relevant skills so that anyone who wants to improve a skill can discover courses instantly and seize the opportunity to grow. We are thrilled to hear that our startup partners are thriving with Sana. We see 88%
of learners recalling information better, team members onboarding up to 34% faster, and up to 98% acquire new skills more effectively. All thanks to personalized adaptive learning. And now, to hear how and why teams of all shapes and sizes should embrace curiosity, I warmly welcome Simon Brown. Hello, I'm Simon Brown, author of The Curious Advantage and Chief Learning Officer at Novartis. Does it feel to you like the world is getting faster? That things are speeding up? It's hard to keep up with it all? It's two years ago at Davos that Justin Trudeau said that the pace of change has never been this fast, but it will never be this slow again. And then we had the pandemic and everything changed yet again. Sachin Nadella talked about how we've seen two years worth of digital transformation in just two months. Things are changing and they're changing fast. But there is an explanation. If we look to Astro Teller, who's the captain of Moonshots at Google X, he provides what's going on. He talks about how there's exponential change of technology, but then our ability to adapt as humans is not keeping up as fast. And where we are at the moment, that rate of change of technology has outpaced our ability to keep up. Scary, but fortunately he offers a solution. And what's his solution? We need to learn faster. Great, but what do we learn? What skills do we need? If we look at our skill set, 26% of our current skill set is going to be irrelevant in three years' time. That's a scary stat. A quarter of what we rely on is going to be irrelevant in just three years. And at the same time, there's new skills coming. 46% of employees have learned a new-to-world skill in the last three years. A new-to-world skill being something that didn't exist before. And then research by the World Economic Forum talks about how 50% of employees are going to need reskilling in the next five years. That's a lot of change of skills. So how as humans do we stay relevant? Well, we think curiosity is the answer. Why curiosity? Well, curiosity actually helps you to learn better. Not just learning from the motivation of learning, but actually research by the University of California found that if you invoke curiosity at your point of learning, it will actually aid recall and create a stronger memory. So it actually helps us to learn. Also research by Francesca Gino, a Harvard professor, found that curiosity also helps us to make better decisions. It helps us to reduce our decision-making errors because we think through the different combinations. We're curious about those different outcomes and that leads to better decisions. She also found curiosity actually helps to reduce conflict within a team. If someone has a different perspective, a different viewpoint, we're curious to know why would they think that? What do they know that I don't? And that curiosity helps to reduce that team conflict. Curiosity also helps to boost communication skills. If we're curious, we listen better, we're keen to hear what others are saying. And then Spencer Harrison, professor at INSEAD, also made the link between curiosity and innovation. If we're more curious, it actually helps us to be more innovative. So many reasons why curiosity is really powerful and could be considered a superpower. But what is curiosity? Well, we consider curiosity as having an attitude of wonder with a spirit of exploration. An attitude of wonder, asking why, wanting to know more, of putting those questions into action through actually exploring and trying things out. Why are we curious? Well, our brains are actually wired for curiosity. Uh, if we're not curious, our brains will actually start to atrophy. It's curiosity that helps us to evolve and survive over the years. We're actually at our most curious when we're four years old, and then our curiosity starts to decline. But at least there is an answer to that. Uh, and we have a model called the seven C's of curiosity that can help you to bring back that curiosity and build your curiosity muscle. So what are the seven C's of curiosity? Well, the first of those seven C's is context. Understanding the context around you and understanding the context of what it is that you're curious about. Curiosity isn't just aimlessly wandering or surfing the internet. We need to bring that structure. So what's the context that you're in, the language of the context? Then we need to find our community, the second C. The community are the people who can help us whether that's the experts, the guides, the gatekeepers, or the people who can coach and challenge us along the way. That community will help us to get lots of information, but that means we need the third C that's around curation. How do we go from the broad to the narrow? How do we filter all of that information to what's really important to help us on that curiosity journey? Then we need to go to creativity, the next C. How do we bring our own ideas? How do we try something different to how others have done it before? What are the new things that we can try out? What are the things we're wondering about? 
But wondering isn't enough. We need to then put those questions or those ideas into action. And that's our next C, construction. How do we experiment? How do we test? How do we try it out and see what actually happens and what actually works and what are the results? When we get those results, we need the next C, which is criticality. What do the results actually tell us? Let's apply a critical eye to it. And let's also check our own biases. What biases are we bringing? Are we just seeing what we want to see and it's confirmation bias? And then whether we get the results that we want or not, all of that builds our confidence. And confidence is the seventh C, but arguably confidence could be the first C because as we get more confident, we can actually be bolder in our curiosity. We can ask bigger questions. We can try bolder experiments. And many companies see the value in curiosity. There's a few years ago in Silicon Valley that billboards appeared beside the main highway. They had a puzzle on, no branding, and if you answered the puzzle, it took you to a website. There you'd find further puzzles. Again, no branding. As you followed those puzzles through, and if you answered those correctly, eventually it led you to a job with Google. And it was a recruitment campaign by Google to find curious people. If we look at other companies like Microsoft, since Satya Nadella taking over, we've seen a focus there on growth mindset and learning. And we've seen huge success by the company as a result. Within Novartis, we have curiosity as a key part of our culture of inspired, curious, and unbossed. That curiosity uh, we've been focusing on through going big on learning. Two reasons we did that. One was to attract and retain talent. The other was to build the skills that we need to deliver against the company strategy. And by going big on learning and supporting curiosity, we've been offering Novartis Associates the best opportunities to learn and develop, giving them easy access to learning and supporting them in their curiosity journey. We found that the role of leaders is critical, that leaders can either make or break curiosity in the environment that they create within their teams. We're also trying to encourage people to spend time learning. We've set an aspiration of 100 hours a year or 5% of people's time to be spent learning and being curious. And after three years of declining learning hours down to 2018, in the last two years, we've seen a doubling of the amount of time that people are spending being curious. And that's flowed through to engagement. Our engagement around learning has gone from two points behind benchmark two years ago to five points ahead of benchmark in our last two quarterly pulse surveys. We've also seen great recognition externally through awards and publications. And why that's important is that goal to attract talent as a result of curiosity. We've asked 1.2 million people over the last couple of years who have applied to join Novartis. What was it that inspired you to apply? Number one reason, opportunities for learning and development. We're attracting curious people and that's fantastic. So curiosity really matters. And in conclusion, in the final chapter of our book, what do we conclude? To question is the answer. Thank you very much. Amazing, Simon. And thanks for reminding us to embrace that inner curious child. Over the past few years, we have been fortunate to partner with some of the world's largest and most influential companies. Global organizations like Novartis, who are reimagining medicine, and PIAB, who are shaping the future of manufacturing. These companies recognize that it's time for the learning experience to join the consumer era, and that their employees not only want, but expect a learning experience that is inspiring, intuitive, and tailored to their needs. When embarking on this journey, a majority of our partners have asked us much the same question. How on earth will we get our thousands of training documents and files onto SANA? And our answer has always been easily. Because automated tools convert existing PDFs and SCORM files into adaptive sustainability or anti-fraud courses in no time. To meet your employees where they are, SANA can integrate with your LXP in a single tap, creating personalized learning paths from existing material so that everyone gets the individual learning experience that they deserve. The results we see from our global partners using SANA are exceeding expectations. Departments are creating content three times faster, and employees are completing upskilling initiatives in half the time, and rating the courses 
with an average net promoter score of over 80. SANA unlocks learning like never before, both for the employee and for the business. And just like Oscar and Joel mentioned earlier, data is the new voice of the learner. And we are proud to be empowering our partners to listen to that voice, to develop their teams and their organizations today, to meet the challenges and the opportunities of tomorrow. Now it's time for me to hand back over to Lauren and our last guest, Peter Manike Rieber. Hi, so my name is Peter Manike Rieber. I work at Novo Nordisk as the head of digital learning and analytics. We've been on a two year journey now, trying to change the digital learning game with data marketing and curation to create business results with the things we do. Brilliant, thanks Peter. Tell us more about this two year journey that you've been on at Novo Nordisk. It's been quite the journey so far. We shifted to a setup with a learning data lead who handles all the data a learning curation lead who makes sure that we've got an infrastructure, a platform or somewhere where we can curate the right learning based on data. And then we needed someone to do marketing as well. It's really, really important with the marketing piece and often underrated. I think you've touched on something really important in mentioning the role of internal marketing. Could you tell us more about why making content available to employees isn't enough? So instead of expecting our audience just to come in the door and start consuming, we need to act like, like they do in the marketplace when, where you want to give relevant context to people. And when you do that, if I send an email saying, hi, Lauren, we know that you're interested in data mining. We also know your confidence level is pretty low, but we also know that this, you know, this training has taken 50 other people to increase their skill levels or to perform better in the business. So click this link to go to this training you'd be much more um, implied to do that. It would be much uh, more relevant for you and yeah. I really like your point about understanding learner behavior because if we can understand behavior, we should be able to change it, right? Can you tell us about the role that data plays in this context? It's a good question and it really comes down to the design of the learning and also what are we really doing? What are we trying to change? We need triggers from the business telling us what's wrong and then we need to start changing human behavior if we can. It's not always training and learning that's the answer, right? But we can definitely help. Now we're really targeting those things that are valuable to the business and where we think that we can change and where human behavior has to change, right? That's one paradigm. And that's also the thing about reskilling. When we're looking into the future and, and we, we kind of like to do that, although we, we can't predict the future, then we can think, you know, and we can also look at the data and see what's changing out there. What are people getting interested in? And how is recruitment changing in the different parts of the organization? What kind of people do we need in the future? And do we need to reskill our current workforce to do something in the nexus of what they're doing right now, which is going to change within the next five to 10 years? Then we need to start you know, to having that discussion, conversation with the business and start distributing learning to adapt to that skill need. Completely agree. Could you give us some insight into how you're opening the game at Nova Nordisk? We track every little move. So we, we obviously, we, we, we have the design thinking process, which comes out with some kind of product, but we track it all the way from distributing it uh, through, um, through an, a marketing software platform where we can actually track whether people open it, whether they take it, and we can track the performance in the business afterwards and all sorts of data points in that equation. And although you've been talking to the customers um, and you, you've smartened up and you've made your design according to people's uh, problems and, and concerns, you still can't be sure that people do what you expect them to do afterwards. Because it's people, it's human beings, and the world changes all the time. So I think everyone constantly gets challenged by their bias and by their beliefs. You need to be able to change things all the time because human behavior changes all the time. Completely agree. That was very well put. Before we wrap up, could you tell us a bit about how you're using data at Nova Nordisk to predict what employees need to learn? We are trying to see how many Teams meetings are people having per day? How many Yammer posts are they liking? What are they talking about um, in headline on a headline basis? And obviously totally anonymized. We, um, we have to make sure that everything's anonymized. But look for keywords and what people are searching for, what they're talking about, um, and also their confidence levels. So instead of asking them how happy they were about training on the other side of what they've done, 
We're asking them, how confident are you to go out and use this and what's blocking you uh, from doing that? Um, and then we collect that insights as, uh, as well and put that into the whole data lake and the whole mix. If this is what Novo Nordisk is able to do with data already now, where will you be in five years time? So I hope we'll get to a place where the business uh, won't be coming to us asking for learning, but that we'll be so in front and, and predictive that we can start telling the business, you're gonna need this. This is gonna happen, or this is the behavior that we've seen. We, th we think we should go this way and that way. It's a much better and much more informed conversation and it's much more comfortable for them. We can rely on, on, on the data and the behavior that we've seen and yeah, history. So um, yeah, learn from history. That is exactly what we want it to look like uh, going forward. So we can focus, especially in our learning teams, on designing those, those powerful learning experiences for the right pockets. Empowering teams to use their resources more wisely and produce higher quality learning experiences. That's definitely a future I'd like to see and a great point on which to wrap up our conversation. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Lauren and Peter. What an inspiring conversation to end today's event on. Today, we've learned from some of the pioneers in our industry about the frontiers of learning. We've learned about how recent advances in artificial intelligence is enabling more personalized experiences, how learning can be made more continuous and measurable, and how it's more effective when we're curious. As we stand at the cusp of a global learning revolution, I hope you, like all of us at SANA Labs, are ready to say goodbye to one size fits all and hello to personalized learning at scale.